So tonight we're going to continue our study through the book of 1 Corinthians, and I hope you guys are seeing um, every week how relevant this book is to our culture and, and to the health of our church. And it's just one of those things that helps you to realize the supernatural nature of the Bible. It has always been relevant, and it always will be relevant. And, and as we go through it sequentially, you can see how everything fits together and how every passage builds off the previous passage. And, and I know I've mentioned this before, but every time I see it, it just puts me in awe of how um, incredibly amazing God is and how he can write something down, have these men write something down so many years ago, and it still applies to us today. Now, last week, we handled one of the more difficult topics in Scripture, um, church discipline and confronting sin in the church, uh, particularly immorality and pride. But from these two sins uh, are propagated a multitude of other sins, all of which need to be confronted. They must be confronted. And, and discipline isn't pleasant. Um, it's difficult. It's painful. But it's necessary. And sometimes we need to go through the pain in order for healing to begin. And uh, just speak to that for a minute. Some of you guys have been asking me how everything is going. Like, how's it going after your surgery? Well, okay. Um, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's painful. But I know that on the other side, it will be better. And I had to have, I had to have a, a post-op appointment, a two-week post-op appointment with a surgeon this week. And he said, well, he looked at everything. He said, well, everything is um, okay, but I need to fix something. And so I was like, okay. And so I thought he was going to tell me what I needed to do or, or maybe schedule me for another appointment or something like that. Um, but no, um, he just started pulling on this line, and he pulled on it and pulled on it until it was where it was supposed to be, right? Um, he didn't tell me that's what he was going to do. I almost passed out. Um, <laughs> It was super painful. And he apologized profusely. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I had to hurt you. But if I wouldn't have done that, you wouldn't heal properly. And you would have set us back months. And even possibly it would have undone all the stuff that we have done this far. And I told him, I said, it's okay. It was necessary. I said, was it necessary? And he's like, yes. I said, okay. It was necessary for my health. It was necessary that he had to do it. I totally understood. Because as a pastor, I have to hurt people all the time. But I don't like it. But I know it's necessary for their personal spiritual health and their growth in holiness. And the same is true of being a father. It's hard. It's hard. But it has to be done. And how do we know what to do? How do we know what to say? By consulting the scriptures. We talked about that last week. 2 Timothy 2 or 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Scripture has to be our guide for teaching. Scripture has to be our guide for rebuking wrong behavior, for bringing something back to the way it should be, for bringing someone back to the way they should be, for training, correct, godly behavior. It has to be scripture. Pastor West talked about that this morning. Society is not our guide. Can't be. Scripture is. And the majority is not our guide. Scripture is. Feelings, feelings are not our guide. Scripture is. God's word is our guide for faith, for our faith and for our practice it guides us in correcting sinners. It guides us in cleansing the church. Now, I know some of you were here. Well, yeah, I was here yesterday. I was at the church. I was here cleansing the church, right, on cleaning day. And I appreciate everyone who showed up. I appreciate everyone who wanted to help, who wanted to clean the church, who, who wanted to make um, it look good for the ladies' retreat that's coming up. But sometimes I wish that we had the same attitude toward keeping the church clean spiritually. You see, the church isn't this building. And I know we say that all the time, and I think we misspeak when we say, well, we're going to go to the church. It's not the building. The church is us. We just gather in this building. Okay? And we need to be clean before God, every bit of us. 
And just like the cobwebs or that, that nobody sees or the, the little nooks and crannies that are hard to scrub and we clean them and they just get dirty again, we have to continually repent of our sin. We have to continually keep ourselves clean. We can't just overlook sin or turn a blind eye to it and just say, well, you know, it, it's just like that. It, it's just how it is. Or it's just going to get dirty again, so why clean it, right? Some people say that. Well, I'm just going to commit that sin again. Why, why, why do I ask forgiveness? I'll, I'll, I'll build up a couple and ask for forgiveness altogether. You can't do that. You have to address it. And, and we have to address sin, and, we, and that applies to us. But it also applies to our fellow members. We deal with our own sin first. Then we go help others deal with their sin. That's what we're meant to do. That's what the church is for. That's what the body of Christ is meant to do. And, and if one of those members won't repent and they won't get right with God, then we have to remove them. But we do it in the hope that they will repent and they will be restored. That's, that's the hope. And we need to separate ourselves from the unrepentant so-called Christians. Not the unregenerate pagans who need to hear the gospel. Not the people who need to be shown the love of Christ. We don't need to separate ourselves from them. We need to separate ourselves from the people who claim to be Christians that aren't acting like it. And we need to quit judging the outside world. That's not our job. That's God's job. We need to start examining ourselves and those within the church. And preach the gospel to everyone. And this is where we're going to begin tonight. We go from, Paul goes from judging to lawsuits and lawlessness and licentious living. That's where, that's where we go. And I hope you see how elegantly the Holy, Script, the Holy Spirit pieces things together through Paul. He's constantly weaving themes from his previous, uh, from the previous chapters or from the previous statements into the following lines to reinforce points over and over. But this is how we learn, right? We need repetition. So God tells us things over and over in his word, hoping that we will get it, hoping that we will see what he's trying to say. And we'll see again that the state of the Corinthian society and the Corinthian church was not unlike our society, not, like, not unlike America, not unlike many churches in America today. And again, the issue of self-centeredness and narcissism are brought to the forefront. They have a problem with this. We have a problem with this. And, and then we see, I think, one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture representing grace, mercy, forgiveness, and transformation. All through the power of God alone. You see, we're all born in sin. And only God can transform us and make us a new creation through Christ. The old things are gone. And the new has come. That's what 2 Corinthians says. And we should praise God for that. Because without Him... We would be stuck in our wretched and hopeless state. That's where we would be. But with him, we have new life. We have eternal hope. And we must never forget that. We must never forget what Christ has done. It should always be in view when we study any part of God's word. So let's look at our text tonight. It's, it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. If you want to stand with me, um, if you're physically able to honor God's word... 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will, shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, ye are, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore this is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather suffer or why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. 
Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You may be seated. We see another problem that's happening in Corinth. We see there are conflicts among Christians. And we know that there's conflicts that were happening. People saying, I like Paul, I like Apollos, I like Peter. Um, but now there's just, just conflicts in general. Because the, the, the Christians at Corinth, the believers at Corinth, were so carnal. They were so taken with philosophy, so bent on doing what they wanted, that they became critical, they became envious of one another. And in their personal relationships, in their business relationships, they were bickering, they were disagreeing to the point of going to court, to the point of lawsuits. And they were a very litigious society, really not unlike our society today. People will sue for almost anything. Why? Because what they want is of utmost importance. Their rights trump everyone else's. Now, this attitude is normal for the natural man, but not for the Christian. If we have been changed, we are no longer in Adam. If we are now in Christ, we should be different. There should be a difference. And Paul is pointing out the fact that these Christians wouldn't have been distinguishable from the rest of the pagan Greek culture. He said, you're acting just like them. You're taking all your stuff to them. What, what are you doing? And, and they were airing their dirty laundry for all the world to see. Now, now, don't think for a minute that Paul is saying that the church should cover up any type of criminal activity or wrongdoing and handle that in-house. That's not what he's saying. We're talking about minor squabbles. We're talking about financial issues here. That's what we're talking about. If something criminal happens, we're obligated to God to take it to the authorities who have responsibility to bear the sword. But these weren't criminal offenses. They were irreconcilable differences. This should never happen within the church, ever. And Paul was outraged that this was happening. He basically said, how dare you do this? And he said it with much more conviction than Greta Thunberg did. How can you do this? He says, how? I can't believe what you're doing. You think that someone has wronged you, and now you're going to court. You're taking this before a pagan court and not trying to work this out in the church. What is wrong with you people? Why can't you get along? If you're bearing the fruit of the Spirit, meekness, forgiveness, love, long-suffering, grace, then how can this happen? How does it happen? You see, back then when they went to court, anyone could come and see what it was about. It was a source of entertainment for them. Um, they didn't have Judge Judy or the People's Court or Hot Bench or whatever that show is. They didn't have that. So they would just go um, and watch what was going on at the Bema seat. And this was at the center of the marketplace in town, and so everyone could see it, everyone could hear it. And Paul is telling them, listen, this is ruining the testimony of the church. The testimony of the church at Corinth is ruined, and the testimony of the believers that are involved in these things are being tarnished. He says, if Christ has forgiven them, how could they not forgive other people? That's what we should think. If Christ has forgiven us, why can't we forgive other people? Paul asks, why? Why do you go before the unjust? Why do you go before the unrighteous? And he wasn't so much saying that the judges were corrupt. He was just saying, these judges aren't Christians. They're not, they haven't been justified by God. Why do you seek justice from one who God hasn't justified? That doesn't make sense. And why do you go outside of Scripture? Why do you go somewhere else to solve a problem that Scripture clearly addresses? And these types of problems, this, these issues were specifically addressed in Matthew 18. Um, starting in verse 15, let's go there, if you would. Matthew 18, and starting in verse 15. 
Jesus says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear it, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, then let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. This is how we're meant to handle conflict within the church. If someone sins against you or someone offends you, you go to them privately. And this is the simplest path to resolution. You don't go tell someone else what this person did or what you think that person did to you. Um, you go to them and them alone. That's who you go to. If you want, if you want to go to the, the person you have a problem with, if you want to work out that problem, you go to the source, right? You don't go somewhere else. It makes so much sense. Now, if they hear you, then you gain a brother. And no one has to know what happened. No one has to know what you perceive to happen, right? It's all worked out. And I'm going to tell you right now that so many church squabbles would not exist. They wouldn't exist if we did just what Jesus tells us to do here. There wouldn't be splits in the church. There couldn't be, right? Two people are involved. I mean, you're going to, unless your church is really small, I mean, you can't have a split, right? <clears throat> Now, if they won't repent, you take two or more people with you. So there's no possibility of a misunderstanding. There's not a, a he said, she said situation, or there's not a your word against his. You have witnesses of what was said by both parties. Now, if this person still doesn't repent, you take him before the church. And if he still doesn't repent, then treat him like a heathen or a tax collector. That's what Jesus says. Now, how, how are you supposed to treat heathens and tax collectors? Do you condemn them and tell people how gross they are and how horrible they are? No. You give them the gospel. And you hope and pray that they believe it and they repent. And that is how Christians are supposed to resolve conflicts. We're to let God guide us through scripture, not trying people on social media or in court. Why would we go outside of the church? Why would we go outside of the body of Christ to let heathens decide our disputes? When we're fully capable, why would we do that? Let's go back to our text and look at verse 2. He says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and the world shall be judged by you? Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. We see the Corinthians' ignorance of their dominion. Will someday judge the world? That's what the Bible says. Will someday judge angels? And judge may mean discerning the guilt of fallen angels. It can also mean to rule or govern them. Not really sure, but think of it this way. We're in Christ, and Christ is above the angels. So in one sense or another... We're going to judge them. But again, this has nothing to do with us. Absolutely nothing. It has everything to do with Christ. He has the authority. And our position in him gives us this privilege. It's not because of what we did. And if we are in this position, then how can we not even judge the smallest matters? That's what Paul says. If you understand that, how come you can't figure this out? Why do you turn to unbelievers the most legally illiterate and untrained believer who follows Scripture and obeys the prompting of the Holy Spirit is far more qualified to settle a dispute and a disagreement between two believers than even the most knowledgeable and experienced pagan lawyer. That's just facts. And I know what most of you are thinking. I thought all lawyers were pagans. Not all of them, just a lot of them. But the point is, even the poorest saint, even the poorest Christian following God's word is better equipped to judge Christian conflicts than the most powerful lawyer who ignores God's instructions. Look at verse 5. I speak to your shame. 
Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brothers goes to law with brother, <clears throat> and that before the unbelievers. Now, for, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. <clears throat> now, there are dire consequences to civil court. Now, earlier, earlier in chapter 4, um, Paul said that he wasn't telling the Christians to shame them. Um, Brother Cliff uh, taught this, uh, or he, he, he spoke about this. He wasn't telling this to shame them, but to warn them about their mistake. But now he's being very clear. What they are doing is shameful. It's sinful. It's complete and utter disobedience to God and his word. Why? Because it disparages Christianity. Paul again returns to his assessment of their so-called wisdom. They were so impressed with themselves. But there wasn't a wise person who was able to discern God's will in these matters. Not, not one. Not one wise person. Brother was going to law against brother and letting unbelievers decide these silly lawsuits. Letting unbelievers see them fight over things that could have been easily resolved in the church. And again, I, I want to be clear here that these were civil disputes. These weren't criminal ones. Because Romans 13 tells us that we are subject to earthly authority because all government is ordained by God. And they are given the sword to execute wrath. On who? The, uh, the evildoer. And I think the Bible draws a distinct line between criminal and civil matters. These were civil. These were frivolous lawsuits that the Corinthians were engaging in. And they were disparaging Christianity. By taking their issues before the unbelievers, they're pretty much admitting that Christianity doesn't work. They weren't loving their neighbor. They weren't turning the other cheek. They were acting just like everyone else. And, and going to civil courts was saying that the worldly system had more wisdom than Scripture, more wisdom than Christ. We have to go outside because we don't have it. But you have to understand the priorities of civil courts don't line up with God's priorities. They don't. Many times they are in direct opposition to God. And when Christians take other Christians into civil court, there will be certain defeat. When Christians sue other Christians, no one wins. Everybody loses. And defeat is certain. Why is it certain? Because God isn't in it. We cannot be like the rest of society and cling to our rights. At least other than the rights that God has given us, that our creator has given us. But because now the, the, the my rights thing is just a front for what I want, what I want to do. Those are my rights. And as soon as we start crying for our rights and what we want and not submitting to Scripture, we have lost. And what did Jesus say about your rights? What did Jesus say about being sued? Look at Matthew 5, 38. He said, you have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not the evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. This is the proper attitude toward a lawsuit. And Paul was echoing this to the Corinthians. He says, why are you taking this to civil court? Why are you harming the church's testimony? Why are you you're harming the gospel? It would be better if you just took a loss. That would be better. It would be better if you just allowed yourself to be cheated. That's what Christ would do. Why are you trusting in the heathen civil court instead of trusting in the sovereignty of God? Do you think that God isn't in control? Because that's what you're saying. It's better to trust in God and lose financially 
than it is to disobey him and suffer spiritual loss. Paul told them, what you're doing is wrong. It's wrong. And you are doing the same thing that you're accusing the other person of doing. You say, this guy is doing this to me, but you're the one who's doing it. Why not just trust God to handle it? Have faith in him, not the legal system. Because he's working everything out for our good and his glory. Trust him. Look at verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now we're going to see a contrast of character here. The first thing we see is the reprobate sinner. Now this is very uh, similar to the sin list that we read last week. Uh, And I think that people misinterpret this as a list of disqualifications. They think that if you have ever committed any sin on this list, that you will be disqualified permanently from entering heaven or Christ's kingdom. People read it that way. But if that were so, none of us would make it. Because the first thing listed is the unrighteous. None of us have any righteousness apart from the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to us in salvation. That's the only righteousness we have. And all of us have done at least one of these things. Fornicators. That's the sexually immoral people. You say, I've never done that. Not me. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever looked at pornography? Then you have. You're guilty. Idolaters, followers of any false religious system or worshipers of false gods. You say, well, I've never done that. You know, I I don't have anything on my mantle or anything like that. Well, did you ever think that you were going to get to heaven based on your works? Did you ever think that you were going to get to heaven because you're a good person? Did you ever say, well, my God would never do that? That's idolatry. Guilty again. Adulterers. The sexually immoral within a marriage relationship. You say, well, that's not me. Nope. I can say I've never done that. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust that isn't your wife? You're guilty. Now, the effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind. This is the L, the G, the B, and the T. And all the thoughts that accompany these letters. You say, well, maybe I haven't done that one. But what about the rest of them? Thieves. They take what isn't theirs. Who hasn't done that? Covetous. They desire things that they have no right to, and they desire to take it. And this desire drives them to do all kinds of evil. Drunkards. They tarry too long at the wine. They desire to be intoxicated and influenced by substances instead of the Spirit of God. Revilers. People who try to destroy others with their words. Gossips, people who sow discord. Extortioners, those who embezzle. They steal indirectly. They falsify documents. They take advantage of others for their own monetary gain. Gold brickers. If this was a a dequalification, disqualification list, none of us would make it. But that isn't what it is. It's a list of characteristics. Do any of these things characterize you? If you are in Christ, none of them should. They can be in your past. And they're probably in all of our past. But not ongoing and not active in your life. You see, verse 11 is the key. And this is one of my most favorite verses. He says, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So now we see the character of a reborn saint. The list before is a list of what they were, what they used to be. This is what they were before Christ transformed our lives. This is what we were. 
Now, I saw a clip this week from Andy Stanley. And I don't know if you know much about, about him. I love his dad. He's horrible. Because he was talking about gay Christians and how awesome they were. Because they're awesome because they understand Jesus better than straight Christians do. Because they, they know because they're misunderstood the way Jesus was misunderstood. But I'm sorry, this, this can't be. Because we should be defined by a transformed life. Not something on this list with Christian in, next to it. Right? You can say, well, if that works out, then I'm a... If you say, well, I have, there's a homosexual Christian. Well, I'm a fornicating Christian. Does that make any sense? I'm an idolatrous Christian. I'm an adulterous Christian. I'm a thieving Christian, a covetous Christian, a drunk Christian, a fighting Christian, an extortioning Christian. Does that make any sense? No. Christian is not an adjective. It's a definition. Some of the Corinthian believers were falling in sin. They were falling back into their old lifestyles. And they needed to be reminded that they were different now. That's how you were. We are different now. We have been washed. Titus 3, 5 tells us, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And this was a washing that we talked about this morning in our Sunday school lesson. We have been washed. The old is gone. The new has come. We have new life. We have been sanctified. Romans 6.22 tells us that, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness or sanctification and the end, everlasting life. We've been sanctified. We have a new behavior. We act different. We've been justified. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, For Christ also hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us unto God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. We're now clothed in Christ's righteousness. He received our bankrupt unrighteousness, and we received his infinite righteousness when he died in our place on the cross. He became sin that we might become his righteousness. We have a new standing. And all of this is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. He transforms us. He dwells in us. Now, as we prepare to close tonight, and as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I think we should examine ourselves. This should be a time of examination. Are you in conflict with other Christians? What are you doing about it? Are you actively trying to reconcile? Are you just talking about these issues with other people and telling them, well, I can't believe what this guy did to me? We need to settle these differences biblically. Not in civil court or not in the court of public opinion. When we air our dirty laundry, we degenerate Christianity and everyone loses. We all lose. You see, sanctification and the Christian life is about direction. It's not about perfection. We're all going to sin. We're all going to fall. But our sin shouldn't define us. It shouldn't characterize us. If you're living in open, unrepentant sin and it doesn't bother you, then you have a problem. If any sin characterizes your life, something is wrong. Now, as, as Brother Russell comes and he leads us in a song and we stand together, I implore you to ask God, to search your heart. Ask him to reveal your sin right now so you can repent and be made right with him.
tonight. And Christian, I implore you, don't look at the list of sin we just over the, the list of sin we just went over and think, well, look at all the ones I'm not guilty of. Don't do that. Look at it and thank God for His mercy and His grace to forgive you of what you were guilty of. And if you need to reconcile with some, somebody, don't put it off. This is your opportunity to get it right. This is your opportunity to get right with God and to get right with your church family. And I urge you to do that tonight.